scholar from the Technical University College, uh, Alexander Williams, as part of our cooperative agreement between the Technical University and uh, Ball State, we have a long-standing exchange at various levels, and most actively at the student level, uh, there we are just getting ready for our 13th Archibald Summer Institute in Berlin. And uh, uh, we have present here two students, exchange students from the Technical University.
And 
down here is Potsdamer Platz, a very famous construction site. Um, you always know, probably know pictures <coughs> of Potsdamer Platz. Now, what's sort of interest of interest for us are the sites of the embassies. The new embassies in Berlin. <coughs> you will mainly find them in this area here. And if, I, <coughs> if I'm talking about South Tiergarten, I mean this district here. So this is this is South Tiergarten area. To here, and these these red dots you see on here are mostly uh, new embassies. Um, the other area which is sort of important is Pariser Platz, which is up here. The Allied embassies are located over here. In an area that you, <coughs> um, that is more of a historical interest, looking at embassies, is this area up here, which used to be a very high, dense, densely, uh, high, very dense, uh, very, very dense housing area. Um, and the only building still existing in this area is an old one. It's the Swiss Embassy. It sort of survived the war. The other big project you can see over here. This is. And the White House in Germany is the Kanzleramt. This is the Reichstag. You might know it from this action Christo, you wrapped it up. That's about, <coughs> that's about all you know or what you have to know about uh, um, the locations of the embassies. Now talking about talking about um, Embassies in Berlin, we, we have to go back as far as the early 19th century. In the beginning of the early 19th century, there actually weren't any embassy buildings, but the ambassadors, which were called that way at the time, were sort of private persons. They stayed in hotels, and they mainly were sort of a messenger, just bringing some, some letters or some statements from a different state. This <clears throat> gradually changed, and international affairs were, were getting more organized and getting more important. And <clears throat> eventually, Berlin um, was in 1871 the capital of the Deutsche Reich, which means <clears throat> it was this was, it was the first time to be the capital of uh, a state which was of very big importance to international affairs. And then <clears throat> smaller. Countries, even smaller countries and bigger countries, started to establish permanent residences um, of ambassadors in Berlin. So, as we see here on this picture, this is the Dutch embassy in Berlin. It wasn't built as an embassy, it was a private aristocratic building. And this is sort of the concept that was, <coughs> until uh, the late 30s, very common, that not a new building was erected, but the old building was used as an embassy. Um, most of the embassies at the time <coughs> were located in the South Tiergarten district. As I mentioned before, you might remember, uh, you know these, these small villas, but they were mainly used as, uh, as embassy buildings. Also, <coughs> where the Swiss Embassy now still is, this area up there was used as embassy area. Now, what happened? <coughs> in 19, uh, the, the early 1930s, the National Socialist Party in Germany, <coughs> NSDAP, uh, especially Albert Speer and Adolf Hitler decided to create a big or south axis um, running from the north from Berlin down to the south, linking the autobahn surrounding the city. So what you see over here is <coughs> this project, this project of the north-south axis. And you can see the dome at the end. Now if you look at this plan over here, you can <coughs> realize how big this thing is. It's about the size of the entire, this entire Spreehan area. It's over here. That, that's about the area where all of those embassies were at the time. So, 
Um, but besides, this building is about as high, or would have been about as high, as the Eiffel Tower. An incredible big building. Now, <clears throat> they already started uh, with the construction of this, this building, so they, they had to tear down most of the embassies in this area. And the embassies had to, be, had to be built. Now, for the first time in history, in Berlin history, New, the type of the new embassy is being erected. This is the Japanese embassy built in 1938. Um, these embassies at the time were, were given to the countries um, that had to move their embassy. So the, the entire planning and the entire uh, design of these embassies were in the hand of German architects. So this, <clears throat> this building is sort of an image a German architect has of Japanese, uh, of Jap well, sort of the, the picture of how a Japanese embassy should look like. But mainly it should demonstrate the power of Germany. So <clears throat> in, the, in, the early, in the early 30s up to the 40s, there was a very, very strong, um, um, oh, what, what do they call it? Um, there was an attitude to give, <clears throat> to give architecture a certain iconographic dimension. The buildings were very neoclassical, very abstract, very, very monumental. It was sort of a state architecture, and every building the state built was in the same in the same tradition. So all embassies that were built new in this area, I recently showed, they all look quite similar to this. Small, small differences. Giving an impression of um, the state architecture, this is this is uh, this is Reichskanzlei. It's also a building made by, by Al Alpashmir. Um, sort of, uh, well, again, the, the White House of the uh, Third Reich. You can see the neoclassical uh, speech in the, in, in the, or style and the very reduced, and very heavy uh, attitude of this building. <clears throat> so these were the buildings that were erected just before the war. When the war came, most of those embassies were destroyed. <clears throat> Only a few survived in this area. This is the Italian embassy. This is the picture I just took before I left for, for, for the States. Um, during the Cold War, those embassies weren't used because <clears throat> West Berlin wasn't the capital of Germany. East Berlin was, but West Berlin wasn't, so all of these embassies were abandoned. And that's the way you can find them still. As I mentioned, East, <coughs> East Berlin turned to be the capital of East, uh, East Germany. So, in trying to be recognized on international levels, um, East Berlin built a lot of embassies. They weren't actually allowed to because East Berlin wasn't allowed by other allied states to be the capital of East Germany. But anyway, they did. And so, you can take a look at <coughs> the short uh, history of embassies in East Berlin. Now, <clears throat> over here, this is the Czechoslovakian embassy. It's sort of a building constructed in the, in the late 70s. It tries to, to catch up with modern architecture in, in, uh, in Europe. Um, it's, it's, it's very ugly. I must say that it's very ugly. And very characteristic are these strange um, golden, well you can't really see it, but this is this brown golden glass. You can't see inside, uh, but probably I don't know if you can look outside from the inside. <clears throat> now the first, the first embassy erected in East Berlin was the Russian embassy. And the special thing about it is that also is sort of a state architecture. 
It's uh, Stalinistic, it derives from the Stalinistic architecture in Moscow. It was already erected in the, in the 50s. Um, and what's a very, very uh, strange about it, but un it's, it's located under the Linden. Under the Linden. And it's the only building that sort of is, has a setback. All the other buildings line up in, in the building line. And this is the only one that's being set back. It's sort of the special stages, stages of the USSR, which you can find here. But it's in that very nice court, though. And you can see <coughs> how inviting it is in a way. But you <coughs> actually don't really see it right now, but so it functions very very well. There's, there's a wall in front of it with a, with a gate and a fence. And it's sort of this distance keeping. We're going to talk about distance and, and city architecture later. Just want to keep you in mind and remember that the Russian embassy built in the 50s looks like this. Now, as I said, the, <clears throat> the German Democratic Republic uh, was very was very interested in getting international recognition. So they built a lot of embassies. That's what I said. Now imagine the right embassy being the Egyptian embassy, and the left one being the Mongolian embassy, and about 12 other ones looking the same, being the Iraqi embassy, and the, well, what, what do you want? <laughs> They're all located in Pankow, and all absolutely identical. This was sort of this socialist uh, um, trial <laughs> to, be, to be equal. All of these buildings were erected and set right side by side. And it's sort of very boring. No identity. No, there's no, no, no chance of any national identity in these buildings. Okay, this is <coughs> now this sort of <coughs> is the end of uh, embassy history in Berlin up to now. These were the last embassies that were built in Berlin. Now there's a new chapter. Since <coughs> government is coming to Berlin, 150 embassies are moving from Bonn <coughs> to uh, the capital again. And at least around, well, I would say 40 or 50 embassies have to be new, have to be new built. New buildings in the city. It's a very interesting task because we have a lot of questions. We will Come a little closer to that uh, a little later. But <clears throat> let, us, let us spend some time on looking on the typology of an embassy. An embassy, <clears throat> as I mentioned before, in the beginning was sort of a private building. It wasn't, it wasn't, um, well, it wasn't really, uh, well, how to say, um, Well, look, let, let us take a look at the pictures and we, we, we can see that the first embassy is sort of still the picture we have of an embassy. If, if somebody asks us, what is an embassy, we would sort of probably agree, well, it must be something like this, looking at the inside. A rather private place uh, with very much hospitality and uh, high level, high level um, dining room. All of these things we imagine that takes place in the embassy. So that's how it actually started. It started in these private buildings. <coughs> then it turned more and more official. And I'd like to show you the next picture. This is <coughs> the embassy of uh, Germany in Vienna. So this is one of the actually first first embassies that really have been built. Before I was talking about embassies in Berlin. But this is one of the first real embassies. Uh, that was erected. And what we can see is <coughs> that it still sort of is uh, this villa type building, sort of a palais, but it has additional wings to it. And these additional wings are already sort of giving this, this, this office building touch to it. There are these small, these small cells, and <coughs> that's the consular part that's, that's starting to grow now. Before it was only residential with 
big, big dining room and ballroom and all this thing that you usually find in aristocratic buildings. But now, for the first time, you see that there are these small cells of office building coming into this building. And also, the organization is changing. We're getting several entrances. Like there's the main entrance on this side, and we have a, <coughs> a different another entrance on this side. Here and here. So this is this is still the private and representative entrance for the ambassador, and this is the consular entrance. So the building is starting to change. Let's take a look at the next step. <clears throat> this is the Italian embassy. You probably might guess. Yes, this is one of those uh, Third Reich architecture buildings, standing uh, placed in the tear garden again. And what we see now is that <clears throat> this is the consular part up here. It's, it's increasing incredibly. It's really, really big. And the part where the ambassador lives is getting smaller and smaller. So the type of building is changing. During the years, certain aspects of the building are getting more and more important. Just to give you an impression, because I mentioned that it sort of started out as a, as a private building. This is the inside of the interior of um, the German embassy in Washington, made by Umas. It still claims to be sort of a private atmosphere. This is still intended although it's sort of an official office building. Now this is the first of the new projects uh, in Berlin. I can show you. <coughs> it's the Austrian Embassy by Holland. He's an Austrian architect and uh, he's quite famous in Europe. I don't know if you know him here. Um, he won this embassy was competition. And what we can see on the floor plan here <coughs> is what I just mentioned. Um, the program has changed meanwhile. An embassy is not only the residence of a, of a private person, but it's, it has become, this is the consular part, this is sort of an office building. See this here. It looks completely different. And this is the representative part of the building. It's done here. This is that. It actually was the embassy. And additionally, we have we have the private the guest lodging and, and the private residence of the ambassador. This is this part of the building. It's over here. And then we have all sorts of entrances. Like here's one, here's one, this is the official entrance of the protocol and the private entrance and here's the entrance and there's the entrance for the garage here's the terrace leading out and so <clears throat> the program of the embassy is getting more and more complex it functions like um, cultural aspects and also commercial aspects conference rooms and just <clears throat> stacking on top of this program can see here also is uh, this very complex program um, is giving, giving sort of a, a conflict, a design conflict. There's so many aspects of this building. It's an official building, it's a residential building, it's, an, it's, it's representative, but it's an office space as well. And as an architect you all have to solve this problem. <clears throat> what kind of impression do you want to give of this building? The answer of Holland is quite simple. He said, well, it's everything, so whatever you want, you can find it. He doesn't try to, to put it together to this one idea. He says, I'm going to separate everything, and that's what, <clears throat> that's what we can see in this project. Now, there's aspect of embassies. I probably already mentioned it. 
Um, empathy represents, represents a nation. This is kind of very, very big, um, uh, very difficult question. But well, just imagine you're supposed to build a house that represents a nation. Well, what will you put, pick out? What's 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 the topic you're going to you're going to, you're going to choose? So <clears throat> why I show you these pictures here is that um, these two buildings were built <clears throat> about in the same time, in the 30s, early 30s. The left one is the Casa de Fascio, um, which is uh, made by, which was designed by um, Terrani, an Italian architect. And this one, this building here is Das Haus der Kunst, <clears throat> architect Trost. Both buildings serve um, as a um, very important building for fascist movement in, in Germany and Italy. And interesting thing about it is that the left building is sort of well, it's a classical modern building and was, it was sort of a symbol for fascism in Italy. Now fascism in Germany decided to use a different language. So, I mean, it depends on what kind of architecture you make. The politics might decide to use just a different language. It's not really that, that you as an architect can, can set up a symbol and people are going to, well, they're simply going to use it. It's not up to, to, it's not up to us as architects to, to find the symbol that fits. This is, this is sort of a different level. So this is what I wanted to show with these two pictures. Now, if you look at, this is, this is the embassy of uh, Germany in, in Washington again, this is the owner's building. Um, he, tries to find, he, he tries to find German identity by using a very classical building, the uh, Museum from Schinkel in Berlin, um, to sort of <coughs> to show us some traditions, uh, using, using the typology of building to build up a tradition to show that there's a link between the old and the new. Or let's look at this here. It's, this is the Japanese embassy in Washington. And it was built in 1979. And sort of puts up the question, well, how traditional can a building be um, nowadays? Isn't it much more Japanese if we build, if we build a building like here from the Dawando, and does it, doesn't it express, express much more of, of our time than just copying an old style building? I mean, using tatami grids or something <coughs> that our under uses um, is sort of a transformation of a, of a tradition into, into our language we use today as architects. Just two more examples. This is the use of, I don't know what the German word or the English word is, would you? Well, <clears throat> it's called a recycled, recycled renaissance part. <clears throat> and just being built into a, a, a new building. Or <clears throat> on this side, it's the Indian embassy, where you can find these doors, which were transformed by using traditional uh, Indian uh, patterns. Another big aspect of, of embassy building, um, well, it's easy to see, is it's, it's the it's safety and security aspects. Um, recent <coughs> history has shown that embassies can easily be subject of severe aggression. And um, the task of architects might be <coughs> to, not, to not put security aspects um, on top of the building after it has been designed, but to integrate these aspects just <clears throat> just from the beginning on, and maybe it's even maybe it's a design idea.
<clears throat> safety aspects can be very, very strong in these industries nowadays. Um, it depends on the country. There are different, different levels of security uh, requirements. <clears throat> but on a very high level of security requirement, there's hardly a difference between medieval castle and, and uh, modern embassy. Um, like, if you look at these two pictures, this is the U.S. Embassy in Saigon. You might still remember these very dramatic pictures of uh, last Americans <coughs> escaping with, with a chopper out of here. Um, it's sort of the last secure territory within an area of crisis. Actually, there's no big difference to, to an old castle. Uh, this, this territory within the walls was the last secure place to be. Now, as I learned, this is, this is called a keep. Also, this is the last secure, sort of the, the last defendable line in the building in the old castle. It sort of, it sort of reflects a uh, very common security uh, concept within modern embassies. There are different lines of defense. Um, we can show, I can show this later. Um, showing you the, the ground floor plan of the American Embassy in Berlin. But there are other aspects which are quite similar as well. Look at these openings over here. Focus on here. Um, the building is trying to minimize the openings towards the outside. And there are only very controlled inside outside relationships. It's very, very controlled. Another aspect is the overview. But well, we don't we don't build very high today, usually to get the overview, we, we use cameras and so on. But it's still the same idea. And in the section you can also see that again there's sort of a succession of, of different spaces. So the last space <coughs> Still the safest space. These sort of concepts of security we soon can find in modern buildings. Well, if you leave, if you, if you give a free hand to the security advisors, <coughs> and they'll say, well, you go ahead and you, you plan this embassy, they would show up with things like this. Um, this is sort of the, this is the, ideal, the ideal picture of a safe building. So, at that point you might start to think, well, how come we don't build embassies like this? So, <clears throat> why don't we, we simply pour as much concrete as possible at one spot and cut a slot in there and keep the surveillance on, on the territory? Well, we don't do this because there's still this aspect of hospitality, and being a guest, and being sort of an open nation, reflecting, uh, reflecting um, sort of more the, um, well, let's say, uh, it's more the picture you give, you give to your host. This is very important. So that's why we don't build embassies like this. I mean, you could imagine that if you <clears throat> if you have a guest and this guest this guest sits down at your table and he always pulls a gun and puts it inside his, his, his plate and uh, pulls on the helmet and he always sits with his back to the wall. You know, it's, it's sort of kind of this strange gesture that, you, <laughs> that we that we can't that we can't really uh, accept. Also, it also, it also uh, has an impact in, in terms of um, city planning. We have a very prominent <coughs> example with the American Embassy in Berlin now. Let me show this. This is <coughs> the Turkish Embassy in Berlin. And you might have heard in the news there was this very, uh, very bad conflict with the Kurds. 
tried application of, of the Israeli embassy. Um, and so <clears throat> the Turkish embassy was subject of uh, possible aggression. So they had to secure it. So what did they do? They had to secure 30 meters around this building, sort of cut a piece out of the city that you weren't supposed to, to touch, you weren't supposed to go there. This can't be this can't be a concept of embassies. Now, as an architect, <clears throat> we would put up the question: How can we how can we avoid something like this? Is there a possibility of getting this into the design immediately, getting this 30 meter set back from the street and use it as a positive design aspect? I want to show you this. Um, the same problem uh, with the American Embassy in Berlin. I'll explain what you see here. Now, <clears throat> the American Embassy is located at Pariser Platz again. It's this building over here. Here's Brandenburg Gate. And what we can see from here is that it's a very, very traditional building. It's nothing that sort of expresses <coughs> a modern nation, I would say. We wouldn't expect the, the high-tech nation uh, the United States behind this building. It's a very traditional and sort of more of a mimicry. Uh, it's, it's, it's a, it sort of hides in the context of this city. Well, the city context is a very <clears throat> But we must understand that, that this building is being located at Potsdam, at, at, at Paris Platz, um, but there are very, very tough uh, regulations on how a building should look like. So it sort of reflects a little bit of this problem. Um, can we turn off the. Uh, okay, now. <clears throat> This is this is Paris Platz. This is Brandenburg Gate, <coughs> and this is the American Embassy. Now we have we have Paris Platz, which is a very very well, it's a, it's a very clear space, a very defined space. And the Berlin the Berlin city planning is very proud of this this uh, uh, this place here. And now what the Americans say, <coughs> the American Embassy and State Department is well. We have to cut out this piece, this piece of the Paris bus, and uh, well, it's sort of our security zone. Well. Now we can't do this. That's what I say. <clears throat> um, this is this is part of the city now, and either <clears throat> there was a mistake choosing this design, there was a competition, and or, or, or you, I don't know how you <laughs> they won this competition. Um, now either they picked the wrong, the wrong project, because this project, this project doesn't deal with with, with the security, the security area. It, it's right, it's right on the edge of uh, uh, of, of the uh, Paris Platz. Other concept, <coughs> they had a small garden in here, and the building began in the back. Might have, might have been much more intelligent wouldn't have this problem with the city. Or otherwise, the other, <coughs> the, the other idea could be maybe a building like this is, is not to be set in the middle of the city. Maybe the security regulations um, sort of put this building more in a, in a, in a suburban context that you actually don't want. But so there's this design conflict and you, you have to solve it in a way. Just <clears throat> once more, this is the American Embassy. And looking at safety <clears throat> aspects again, um, the entry from from Paris Atlantis is here, with that arrow over here. And then there's this, this 
center Matunga. And you can see the you can you can actually see all the safety aspects on it. You can see that it's impossible to enter um, sort of the crowd that can't enter this building immediately. These doors over here, they're, they're spreading like there are two and there's one and there's one. And then we have these huge, huge pillars in this in the way sort of blocks the, the very, very rush uh, entry of the building. And then you have this space here, and you have all sorts of security devices to let people out enter the building immediately. These very, very strong walls and blast-proof, uh, blast-proof, um, very rigid uh, walls. And you have here anti-spionage walls to the next buildings, two of them. All these security devices are very, very important <coughs> for embassies today. Okay, this is <coughs> this is another embassy. This is one of the <coughs> uh, this is another embassy. It's this is the British Embassy. Again, there was a competition, <coughs> and the competition we won is the one we see over here. It's from uh, Michael Wolford. But let us take a look at <coughs> the second prize. Is it possible to handle the British one? This is, <coughs> this is a project from Elsa and Stroma. Um, to compare it with the American Embassy, we really can say that this is sort of a very, <coughs> well, it's, it's, it's all glass. And the entire facade is, is glass. Um, security aspects don't seem to be so very, very important for this building, as you can see at the first moment. You see four big, four big openings here, and the flag, and the rest of the building is entirely glass. If you take a look at the inside, you see that the building, the actual building, is set back, and the glass wall is well, it's sort of a it's sort of a distant toward the street. This is the section of the same building. And you can see here's the street, and the building is over here. There's a huge hall in the middle. <clears throat> the ambassador is sitting on top. And this is the view from the inside hall. So it's a very, it's a very, in the first view it looks very, very, it's a very open design. Uh, it sort of seems to be not defensive. But if you look at it closely, it's very defensive. It's, it's, it has this inside world and there's actually no, no view to the outside. Uh, the only openings you have are these windows here on top, and the ambassador is sitting like in sort of a heaven on top of the, of, the, of the whole building. So there is a safety concept to this building, and it looks completely different as we, as we would expect it. It is very interesting about it.
Lancelot lands again. And you see <coughs> the mini competition with Michael Wolford. Here's the small courtyard in the middle. <coughs> and going back again. It's a very, it's a very solid, very simple facade. And the only thing that is opening is this horizontal cutting. And this is the office of the ambassador. Looking at the program again, it's, it's also very interesting because the ambassador doesn't live here anymore. This is an office building. It's only an office building. His, resi his residence is somewhere completely different. Now, I'd like to show you the next project. This is the French Embassy, and sort of what is interesting about the French Embassy is to look at <coughs> the elevation over here. It's a pretty high building, and what you don't really see is <coughs> that, um, well, it appears that it's a, it's a, it's a residential building. It sort of changes the scale. The trick is that you have two or three um, behind these huge windows. And so it appears to be the traditional old palais type building. Actually it's very big. This, this is only what you see in front. And the rest of the building is stuck to the block. It's sort of two rows, two rows behind the front building. There are two courtyards in the back. The architect is was on park. <clears throat> in the beginning, I told you this, uh, that there was this, this still one remaining building uh, at the North Spreeboom, which is the Swiss Embassy. And looking at this, <clears throat> we see the old building of the Swiss Embassy, and we see the project, this, so this additional project from here. From Dina and Dina, Swiss architects. Now this building sort of expresses this, this Swiss type uh, um, picture of precision and sort of a minimalistic attitude. Um, I don't know if you know very much about the Swiss architecture, but <coughs> this is a very interesting aspect. And maybe we show uh, give another lecture on the Swiss architecture. Okay, I'll just continue with more. Now this is <coughs> this is the Scandinavian embassy, also in South Tyrol, and very uncommon about this project is <coughs> there are five embassies which are linked together by skin, which is surrounding this area. There's one common building. The entrance, and this is the entrance, and it's very, it's, it also deals very much with, with the security aspects. <coughs> what you see from the city is only this wall, and the embassies hide behind this wall. There are only sort of um, semi transparent uh, windows in there. Coming in from the south side, um, we find these five, or let's say six different, different blocks. They're using materials which can be found in their home countries, like wood, Norwegian granite, Norwegian coal granite. <coughs> and every 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 embassy has a very peculiar and unique um, appearance. Here we can see the skin again. Here's the project again. This is the location. The next neighbor is the Mexican embassy. You can see the small sketch. Um, the architect is beyond these buildings, uh, also uh, an embassy. Sort of specialist in this embassy architect. And the 
concept of this building is rather simple. We have a very, very strong sculptural facade um, with this sort of opening. And then there are um, very, very sculptural um, elements which are set behind. In, in the section you can see how it's organized. You see that here's, here's, here's the street, you come in, here's this huge facade, and then there's this open space, this big rotunda, with all of the circulation, the vertical circulation, and all of the, uh, the other functions are just normal. And here on this side of the entrance. This is, this is a project of uh, Bonhage, Leonid Bonhage, rather young architect in Berlin. And this is a very interesting project again. <coughs> it's located here in Kriegarten. And the concept is very simple. We have a wall which surrounds the building. We have <coughs> different types of terraces and interiors. <coughs> There's this entrance. Uh, <coughs> cut out and the only opening to the building is here and what is cut out is, in, is set into the terrace over here that's the that's the office of the ambassador it's using very very typical Indian topics like the stair you probably know this <coughs> astronomic uh, Buildings in India, they're quite similar. And we also we also remember uh, Louis Kahn's Louis Kahn's buildings. Dutch deal with water. They um, 
sort of their, their main element. They gain, they, gain land, they gain land from the sea. So <clears throat> this location is sort of part of the concept. And as we see here, um, all of these boats here, it kind of, sort of reminds of Amsterdam and Rotterdam and so on. And this very, very uh, open building, it's mainly glass, sitting like a cube <clears throat> at the edge of the water. And the, embass the, the ambassador, the office of the ambassador, I don't know if you can see it, it's sort of this glove-like thing which sticks out of the building and points out very, very far. ambassador's office. No security aspects at all. I mean, <clears throat> if you want to hit the ambassador, it's, it's, it's really easy because you know where he is. Um, but it sort of gives a very, very strong concept. And that's what I like about this project. And that's why I'd like to show you this project <clears throat> at the end of this lecture. And I would like to thank you.